the question that's been burning in my mind. I want to understand what's behind the name Snorkel. Yeah, that's a great question. I think a lot of people ask us that question, actually. Uh, I, I love the name personally. This sort of dates back to the research days. The snorkel started off as a research project at Stanford that was worked on by Alex, Chris Ray, a few, and a couple, uh, you know, Chris Ray, who's a professor there. And they, the, before snorkel, they were working on a system called Deep Dive, which was also sort of, was so, also sort of being used for creating sort of knowledge bases from unstructured data. And I think snorkel tried to sort of make a lot of these a lot, make, make things a lot easier for you know, subject matter experts and other people to sort of build these systems. And so because it's easier, it's snorkeling and not deep diving. Yeah, I get it. I like it. Because when you said deep, I was like, ah, oh, now I get it. So we're <laughs> snorkeling, we're not deep diving. I actually really like that. That's really good. <laughs> okay, well done, snorkel. Science. Science. Technology. Technology. Medicine. Medicine. Health. Health. These four things make the world go round. Without them, we couldn't exist. This is the Monday Science Podcast, a weekly show bringing you the latest research and news in science, technology, medicine, and health, answering your questions or finding experts in the field to answer them. Your host is a pharmacist, an award-winning scientist. She leads her own research group and is the founder of King's College London Fight the Fakes, a tad bit on the qualified side. Welcome to Monday Science. Here's your host, Dr. Bahija Rimi Abraham. Today's guest, we have Brandon Yang. Hello, Brandon. How are you today? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Brilliant. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about AI and healthcare, and it's something I've been going on about over the last few months of the podcast as a real area of interest. So I'm really excited to have you on the episode today. The best thing to start us off is if you can just tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm a, you know, currently I'm a machine and learning engineer at Snorkel, at Snorkel AI, which is a startup that sort of works on sort of making AI practical for a whole host of business applications. You know, I've sort of been in, interested in, in the field of AI and healthcare for a while now, ever since sort of my, I was working on my undergrad and master's at Stanford, where we worked on sort of one of the first applications of AI to radiology. So using S AI on chest x-rays and, you know, the field was a lot newer at the time. And, you know, there were a lot of practical challenges that we weren't aware of and weren't addressed at the time, but it was just exciting to see that, you know, AI techniques could do so well on important healthcare tasks. And then, you know, after that, I went to Google Brain. I was an AI resident there doing research, both on fundamental deep learning and computer vision, and then also sort of working with the Waymo team, which works on self-driving cars to sort of get some of these ideas deployed. And I learned a lot more about sort of deploying AI applications there and also fundamental research. And, you know, and then now at Snorkel, you know, it's a much smaller company, but, you know, we have a, you know, I think, but it's also focused on sort of taking research and sort of making practical improvements to how people build AI applications. And in healthcare, there's a lot of sort of excitement, a lot of hype around the possibilities, but there's also very, very real practical challenges and, and also sort of opportunity for a lot of practical value. And, you know, that's sort of understanding that has been part of my journey and hopefully something I can bring to the podcast today. Thank you so much. And and you've had such a, a, a wide career. I mean, Google Brain and everything is amazing. Yeah, for me, with AI and healthcare, my biggest thing, and we'll talk about that, is sort of the ethics. And that's really an area where I'm, okay, what's going on here? We've talked about AI a lot and with deep learning and natural language processing on the podcast. Just to give us a brief overview, how so how does deep learning and natural language processing all relate to artificial intelligence? Yeah, that's a great question. Of the terms, AI is the broadest. It generally just refers to the building of intelligent machines. You know, whatever that means, it's quite broad, but it's just machines that can think and act people do or have some of those capabilities. NLP is sort of a, a section of AI, which sort of focuses more on learning and understanding natural language data. So, so this is sort of allowing sort of natural language, allowing models to sort of learn from, learn from text data, learn from speech, and also be able to make, you know, to, to both be able to classify them and also be able to make intelligent responses. And deep learning is sort of a part of AI that builds on machine learning, which is when, which is allowing sort of computer programs to learn from data. 
And in deep learning, people have large neural networks where they, which they train on data and can automatically learn features from the data. So compared to normal machine learning where users design features and then sort of let the machine learning model sort of adjust the parameters of those features. Deep learning, you create a deep network and let the, let the model sort of learn the features from the data itself. And what's interesting about it is it sort of moves the effort from sort of model model design to more of data collection. So, you know, that's a rough breakdown, hopefully not too general, but. No, that was really good. Um, so whenever, because this whole conversation about AI and healthcare and deep learning healthcare, how are you, I, I, I feel, sorry, the, the question was about to say, how are you defining it? As if I'm putting all the pressure on you to define how everybody is saying what they're saying about healthcare. But obviously healthcare is a very broad term. So how do you define healthcare when we're talking about it in this context of AI, deep learning? and, and... Yeah, I, to your point, it's very broad. In my head, it's more, it's, it's easier to sort of think about, it's easier to think about it in terms of where and how it might be used in healthcare than it is to sort of define healthcare. In general, to me, it seems like anything that's sort of, you know, is part of the healthcare delivery pipeline, which is very, very long. But what's exciting is that AI sort of has various impacts in different parts of the field here. So, you know, it, it applies quite broadly. You know, there's sort of a lot of work in imaging. So for radiology, so, you know, automatic diagnosis and you know, other things, and sort of, you know, super resolution, other things for radiographs. And they also do something similar for path pathology, for sort of grading, for grading slides. And, you know, and I, I'm probably simplifying it, but, you know, they grade slides and do a lot of other things on pathology slides. There's also a lot of work on EHR mining. So, you know, EHR is a big, nat a big pool of both structured and natural language data. And so it's, you know, trying to learn to be able to either extract important information or, you know, make better diagnoses, help physicians using electronic health record data. So this ties into the natural language processing side of things. And to even get more specific, you know, there's with clinical trials, there's the, you know, I think basic things that people want to do are just pull out basic things from the inclusion exclusion criteria, things like that. And that's also an application for deep learning and natural language processing device surveillance. So, you know, trying to see how devices help or hurt people based on electronic health record data. So it's quite broad. I, I don't know if that gives a good definition, but maybe this is a definition by way of seven examples. No, it's really good because I, it's always a question I have because when we talk about AI in healthcare, then we talk about AI in pharma. And for me, that I sit in the middle in the sense of I'm an academic, I'm interested to know how artificial intelligence, AI can help my research, can advance my research, can bring us closer more to clinic. And I guess when I'm just researching and trying to understand how I can use AI in my own research, I see these terms AI in healthcare, and I'm like, oh, well, I am in healthcare. But then when I see AI in pharma, and I'm like, oh, where am I? So, so no, those examples are really helpful. And I've actually seen a lot of work around use of AI with imaging. We do a lot of, well, not me personally, but in, at my university, I've seen a lot of that being used to kind of fine tune and, and improve the diagnosis from imaging. So no, those are really, really helpful examples actually, and, and kind of puts it into context as well. Is there any, do you, I don't know if you, if you might know, but is there any, uh, or do you know of the first ever reported application of deep learning tech in healthcare? Was it successful, the first case? Was it successful or was it one of those examples where it didn't go well, but then everybody's learned from it after that? Yeah, that's a great question. By the way, just hopping back a little bit because, you know, you sparked my interest with, with deep learning and pharma. One thing that I may have skipped over is there's actually a lot of recent work also on AI for drug discovery that might be a little bit more relevant to you. This is usually is more like the basic science slash biolo biology slash chemistry side and less on the delivery of healthcare side. But, you know, this is sort of using graph neural networks to sort of screen and sort of predict properties of various molecules. And, you know, this is fairly, fairly, fairly relevant to the drug discovery slash pharma industry. I don't know if you've actually seen any similar applications in your own work or not. I have actually. So there's a few companies that I've seen and I have started to see the use of AI in drug discovery. So I attended this conference. It seems forever now, but I actually think it was this year, except this year has lasted forever. <laughs> this year has so gone on forever. Yeah, no, it was at some point in my existence. I attended this conference and it was a med tech conference and there were loads of different examples of companies using AI in different ways and I'll explain those ways that they used it but to, for a drug discovery purpose so there was a company that they specialized in orphan drug designation so those rare disease drug and drug discovery and what how they used AI was primarily I hope I'm getting this right but initially a sort of screening of the data 
And so there, there was this whole thing, and this is one of the reasons why I was very interested to talk to you because I know Snorkel is very focused on that data management, and we'll talk about that in a bit. But they, so in in for one of these companies, they were really focused on that starting data. What's their primary data set? Where is that being sourced from? And majority of the time, it would be sourced from the literature. Mm -hmm. And then they were using AI to kind of sc screen that data mm -hmm. and then identify patterns and possible connections for a certain rare disease and then using that to identify potential drug targets and then what they would do from that data and that information they would then use that to kind of shape what goes on in the lab and then what was very interesting in particular with that company they were getting drugs quicker onto market now of those who don't know with um, orphan drug designation or rare disease drugs the route to market is a little bit quicker there's certain ways in which you can get the product onto the market quicker in clinical trials compared to conventional i guess drugs but i thought that was very interesting so they were using the and i guess that's where you know people are using ai in different ways then there was another company as well that they were looking at with the AI was finding patterns but from an, an already complete data set that they had put together in-house so it was it's just very different very interesting but the drug discovery route definitely an area that's growing there are a few companies that i've seen that are are advancing i guess so my area is is is, is drug development so i'm trying to develop the drugs i'm trying to develop the drug delivery systems and things like that. so it's it's that step after you found the molecule now we want to design the op, the, the perfect optimum you know optimum <laughs> ultimate drug delivery system that's going to take that drug from from you know from bench to clinic i guess so taking so the patient's taking it and how's how do you make sure that's going to work in the best way so that's where i'm trying to find the niche for ai for me and actually in, in all honesty just full disclosure i have totally used the podcast to educate myself on this journey by talking to experts such as yourself what's the point in having a podcast if you can't learn from it as well so so yeah so i, I definitely and also as, as you would know definitely pharma and pharmaceutical industries are really now looking into AI. But the, the question I have to ask, actually, it, it, are we, for those of us who haven't been into AI and healthcare, AI and pharma, are we too late? Is, are we those the sort of people that only found out about Bitcoin 10 years later and now there's no point in investing because, you know, it's too pricey, no, in, we're too late. Am, am I too <laughs> late to get into AI, healthcare, AI, pharma? The answer is Definitely not. I would hope that sort of AI goes on a slightly better trajectory than Bitcoin so far. But yeah, no, I don't definitely not. To your point, you know, just hearing you talk about it has made it even more clear that, you know, there's sort of two sort of stages. One is sort of, you know, we get AI techniques that start to work well, both in theory and on specific, you know, hand curated data set on the research side. And we're at a point where you know, AI is starting to be used in applications, but there's a couple key questions, which, you know, we'll also discuss, which are, you know, whether or not you're applying AI to the right problem, right? One is identifying a problem where an AI approach would actually help given its, you know, drawbacks and its benefits. And a lot of that requires subject matter expertise, which, you know, clearly you have in the, in the drug development side that I clearly don't. So I'm not able to sort of speak to that by identifying sort of the right problems and the right challenges there that can easily be automated with AI approaches is, um, is completely, is very, very ripe. And people haven't done both because there's practical challenges and also because, you know, to this point, there hasn't been that much interface between people working on AI and subject matter experts. And, you know, this is something that we think about a lot at Snorkel and, you know, will be really relevant for sort of the next phase of development here. And, you know, the podcast is one great way to start the mixing and there's going to be a lot of other great ones too. Thank you. No, thanks for that. And, and it's true. And that, that merging those two worlds and finding how we all communicate with each other, as you rightfully said, the subject matter experts and the AI and tech experts, how do we make sure we get in the room and speak the same language? Because I, I personally think that's really how it all starts. It's just a conversation. Then you find out more about each other and then you find that common ground and using respective expertise can find that sort of solution but yeah go back to the question i asked so yeah that's the, right the, the case of the first ever if you have that information first ever application of deep learning tech in healthcare yeah so i don't have 
that off the top of my head, but I, I sort of have a few interesting historical bits for you where, you know, you know, AI has a long history in healthcare, and this is why it's hard to pin down sort of one successful application. You know, the very, the earliest ones that people talk about are sort of expert systems in the 1960s for doing diagnoses and other things that are mostly based on sort of handcrafted rules by users. And so, you know, it's hard to pinpoint a first date. One one date that I'm excited about is in 2016, you know, folks at Google had built a model to grade diabetic retinopathy, and it was sort of studied to be on par with board-certified ophthalmologists. And it was exciting to see a deep learning vision approach per performing about as well as some board-certified radiologists, uh, sorry, ophthalmologists. And they did a fairly decent job with sort of validating that. And that was really exciting. And, you know, this year also there's some exciting milestones. So, you know, the cart has definitely not left where in, you know, just this year, Viz AI was the first sort of AI company to get reimbursement for AI augmented medical care. So they, you know, they also sort of chose a very, you know, a very strategic application where they used AI models to, to sort of triage stroke patients so they could get care sooner. And so this is back to the point of identifying the right problems. And they were the first to actually get reimbursement from Medicare. And, you know, that's, that's going to be a big first in terms of AI assisted care becoming more important. And then, you know, also this year, there's the big spirit guidelines from Nature and a bunch of other journals on sort of guidelines for applying AI in healthcare. So the field is really still up and coming, at least in this perspective, even though, you know, AI in general has a very, very long history in, in medicine and healthcare. Yeah, that's really interesting, actually. The spirit guidelines, I'll have to check that out because it does feel, I mean, I'm always amazed when I here when I speak to people such as yourself and you say, oh, AI since 1960s. I only heard of AI a few years ago. <laughs> so I was like, wow, my Bitcoin theory, I really, well, you've reassured me, but my Bitcoin theory is not applicable in AI. But anyway, <laughs> we're not too late, hopefully. <laughs> but, but those are the things that, you know, I see as the next, well, so, sorry, not so much the next wave, but clearly that's what the things that have been in discussion now, things, the guidelines, guidance on how we work within this space, because it's limitless, you know, as with everything, it's it's limitless. There's no there's no limit to where you can go with AI, but it gets really down to individuals' ethics and, and things like that. And it's also quite interesting to hear all the advances that have gone on in 2020, because I know 2020 has been the year where tech has actually advanced. It's been the area of the sector that's advanced the most compared to everything else. So it's really interesting to hear that. And also there's been so many conversations and, and discussions around if we should all just be focusing more on kind of that tech and tech interface way of working and, and collaborations and all those things. We, who knows how long we're going to be in <laughs> the current situation, as we always say, these auspicious times. <laughs> yeah. You had mentioned before there were some points to discuss. So I just put some considerations with AI and, and healthcare. So I just wanted to know what are the practical challenges when you're trying to apply these deep learning technologies or AI in Yeah, there's tons. I can think of four or five off the top of my head. You're welcome to interrupt or to interrupt or either or, or we can circle back to any of these, but there's tons. The first and arguably the most important one is problem selection, right? We talked about this a little bit before, but there's, it's important that, you know, you choose a meaningful question to apply AI to and the one that actually improves care and complements existing workflows. You know, especially earlier, there were a lot of works that were trying to sort of do things at the level of, you know, a practicing radiologist or a practicing ophthalmologist, not in the near future, will we be completely replacing them and actually choosing problems where AI complements, um, you know, existing workflows, such as in the, in the triage case will be more fruitful and tied into that is sort of the evaluation aspect. So a lot of deep learning models these days are sort of evaluated on held out test sets or other sort of data uh, or other data sets that but it's actually really important before you deploy these models, especially if they're used for in, you know, a clinical setting to actually evaluate them in clinical practice and do a clinical trial and see whether or not they're effective. One very ob obvious sort of failing here is when they were starting to use CAD models for mammography, you know, 10, 20 years ago when they were so there was they were getting reimbursements for for you know using a CAD model alongside human humans for sort of identifying cancers and mammographies and it turns out 10 or 20 years and hundreds of millions of dollars later it didn't actually improve the number of cancers that were being screened in practice even though you know the CAD model was quite good right so this is purely in sort of like problem selection and evaluation side of things when you say CAD model I'm just when I hear CAD from a 3D printing computer aided digital file is that what CAD is in this context it's a little bit different. This is computer-aided diagnosis. Ah, okay. But mm -hmm. this is sort of a computer system that was trained with rules and various sort of pre-deep learning technologies to 
identify, you know, cancers in, mam in mammography scans. And yeah, it turns out that even though the, the model did quite, or I guess it's not a model, maybe even though the system did quite well, when you put it together with an actual grade, someone who grades mammographies, actually, uh, the combination is either on par or slightly worse, depending on which study you read, than just having them do it themselves, because they start to lean on the AI system and stop, you know, doing their own, and you know, so evaluating the combination and these sort of combined workflows of AI and, and, and experts in an actual workflow is critical and an important sort of outstanding area of work that some people, some, some have done, but not, not, not enough. It's an example in the radiology setting is to train a model that sort of does, that does sort of uh, abnormality detection on radiographs. It takes months of hand labeling from practice board certified radiologists, which is expensive and difficult. And it's very difficult to get this for the whole range of tasks that we would want them to do it for. Another practical issue is sort of out of domain generalization. So. The question here is, will a model trained on one data set still work as well when work when used on a different set of data or in a different location? So even changing hospitals, you know, oftentimes this will cause AI models to perform worse because they're sort of being, they're doing, they're sort of being used on a domain that they weren't trained on. So uh, the issue here is sort of, you know, can we at least identify when this happens? Right. And then better yet, is it possible to have models that are more robust to this? And then very connected there is a sort of subgroup performance and hidden stratification. And what, and what I mean here is sort of models can often do better on some small subgroups of the data than other subgroups of the data. And this can actually be very clean, clinically, clean meaning. So one paper that sort of shows this is that a model trained on a very common chest x-ray data set actually performs really well at classifying pneumothorax, which is a condition with the lung, when, when there is a chest strain in the image than when there isn't. So the issue with the data set was that a lot of the sort of, a lot of the radiographs actually already had chest strains in them to treat pneumothorax. And the model was using that as sort of a signal for whether or not the patient has it. And then it was doing a lot worse when there was no chest strains present. And this is particularly problematic because, you know, it's clinically more important to catch the case when you know, there isn't a chest strain than once the problem has already been resolved. And so, so, you know, you know, just sort of being able to measure and evaluate the performance on these subgroups is going to be important. And the last one is sort of just interpretability. This sort of ties back to humans and models working together, but you know, it's hard to sort of with current deep learning models to validate that they're predicting the right thing and um, for the right reasons. And that's probably, that's part of the reason of the previous issue exists. And for humans and models to work well together, there needs to be sort of more, more work on interpretability. So a lot of practical challenges and a no, lot to work on. And I'm sure there's even, even more. You've just, you're scratching the surface, you're pleased <laughs> with us. But there was something I like that you said, the model complementing the AI model and the humans working together. It's a complementary uh, initiative, I guess. It's maybe initiatives that may, may not necessarily be the right word, but I, because a lot of physicians, a lot of healthcare professionals would feel a little bit threatened by the application of AI into their environment because it's, oh, are you wanting the system to replace us or to help our workflow? And I'm, I'm not sure if that's always clear with some of the initiatives. I feel that there was, oh, I might have talked about it on the podcast. There was a paper, they were using AI to improve the diagnosis or a diabetic patient diagnosis. And it was meaning the AI to try and diagnose the blood sugar levels. Actually, it was one of the episodes of the podcast. I'll put it in the episode description. But it was to train the AI to diagnose the blood glucose levels in a better way than the physicians. And then they were comparing the accuracy of the AI to the accuracy of the healthcare professional who was doing the diagnosis. And it was quite an interesting article, it was an interesting study, but in the back of my head, I'm thinking to myself, well, is the aim to replace? You know, as you rightly said, we need to look and see where can AI be used to complement? And I, this is where that conversation between healthcare and pharma, in pharma, you can see where it can easily compl complement as opposed to replace. And I wonder if just by the nature of the sector and kind of the, the research aspect of things, you tend to look more for how systems or tools can support and improve your working and, and get you to the answer quicker and quicker and more effective and everything. Whereas in healthcare, because of the patient being the end user, it's a little bit more delicate. So you're therefore maybe looking to see how can you speed things up, maybe, I don't know. So it's, it's it, maybe there needs to be more focus on that complementary element so that you know, there isn't a rebellion against AI from the whole sector rebels just because they feel a bit threatened. Do you see what I mean? Because they yeah. might be replaced. No, I definitely, yeah, that definitely makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I mean, one is, you know, it would be one thing if AI models were ready to replace 
healthcare professionals, which, you know, for, for these practical reasons, and, you know, we'll, we'll be getting into the ethical challenges. And, you know, for those reasons as well, we're, we're relatively far from AI models just completely replacing human physicians, both from like a performance standpoint, from a patient comfort standpoint. You know, there's a lot of outstanding questions there, and we're a little ways away from that happening. And for now, the things that will lead to the most clinical impact are the things that complement existing workflows and existing humans and sort of try to fill in the gaps where people don't do as well. You know, whether that's earlier triaging and helping people, you know, get access to treatment faster or prioritizing important cases for radiologists. You know, there's a lot of sort of room and, you know, and we should do, you know, better studies here. But for now, there seems like there's a lot more impact in sort of, you know, making the system better than trying to whole completely tear out and replace a part of the system until some of these challenges are addressed. And, you know, and it'll be a slow collaborative process, my Hopefully. current take on things. I feel positive about this. Now we've talked about ethics, my favorite section <laughs> to talk about. So let us get stuck in. Please give us, I don't know, just what are the ethical challenges in this area combining deep tech and AI? I always say deep tech. AI, all of it. Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's a juicy one. You'll, you'll, uh, oh, you yeah. know, there's, there's several. One, one, one issue for sure is bias. A lot of times AI models reflect and can even amp sometimes amplify the bias in the data that they're trained on. One particularly interesting paper that I came across recently by by Zhang and a few other folks was, you know, actually they sort of looked at language models trained on clinical text. So language models are, 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 are a type of natural language model that learns to sort of predict the next word in, in a given, in a piece of text. Now, if you, you know, one way to think about it is that this sort of gives the model with some intuition about, you know, what things mean and how sentences and words fit together that make them very useful for other downstream applications. So they looked at sort of a uh, language model trained on clinical and it predicts sort of different likely courses of, and so what it was, was they basically had a fill in the blank exercise, which was basically given given a, a sentence to sort of fill in the remaining, the, the blank words. And it turns out that there's sort of different, that actually when you, when you have the person be different race, you'll get different predictions for courses of action. One very cogent example they show in their paper is that they talk about a blank race patient becoming belligerent and violent and sent to a fill in the blank. And it turns out that, you know, for Caucasian patients, it says we should send them to a hospital, but for, you know, African patients, we should send them to a prison, which is extremely wrong. Oh no, that's just right? awful. It's that awful. And it's not, awful. and so obviously, you know, people wouldn't directly use a language model in this way, fill in the blank in a clinical setting. This is, you know, not exactly that, but it shows ways in which this can, can go wrong. And it's, it's awful, right? So as you, as you were, as you were saying that I just sort of had a feeling of where that was going to go and I was, please don't, please don't. And actually this is, this is outside of the scope of this discussion because we're talking about healthcare, but I know that, you know, AI applications in immigration, in police force and things like that, that's something that's been rolled out, you know, facial recognition to then determine if that person's a crime or not. And there is definitely a racial bias that people are observing and it's well known. The issue with all of that, as we know, is what happens when that becomes the go-to and then we're trusting. It's not to say that AI is racist, but how do we, what happens? What's the in-between? Is it a case of that starting data? Maybe you need more diverse population to do the screening to ensure that there's no bias in the, in the AI. To your point, you know, not, not entirely the subject of the podcast, but it is becoming more and more societally relevant. I've recently voted, it's, it's voting season in America, and I recently voted on a proposition in California to try to replace the bail system with one that's more on um, predictive, trying to classify flight rate. You know, and so that's one very direct application where, you know, and, and it's AI models, you know, are trained on data. And after a while, they start generating the data once they're the ones that make these decisions. And so it's really, really important to get this right, because otherwise it's not going to self-correct. Right? So it's definitely a very, very big issue. And it requires, frankly, just more work to study. I don't think there's any very sort of simple or very, any simple sort of fixes here, unfortunately. It's a very profound point, actually, in that self-correcting, people forget that the AI won't. It will just keep doing, optimizing what you've told it to optimize on and just keep working on that. So if we don't get the initial information, the initial data, right, ethical, you know, ethically sound, non-biased and all of that, then the repercussions later on could be quite profound. Back to your ethical challenges with healthcare. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, one more here is just an issue of more of model fairness. So one, ex one interesting question here is that, you know, models can perform worse for some groups, some subgroups than for others. So 
you know, this is tied in a little bit to the bias, but you, you can have models that sort of perform much better at, at identifying certain diseases in men rather than women, for example, just because they're more overrepresented in the data set. And, you know, although this is an issue already in some clinical trials, but either way, for models as well, you know, there's this there's this issue where sometimes the model trained will perform better on better on men than on women or, or you know, could be the other way around, depending on the data. And there's an in interesting ethical question here, which is sort of, you know, should we deploy this model? What if, you know, what if for both men and women, it's better than the standard of care, but it's still much better for one subgroup than the other, right? And it's, 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 it's not clear when we should be deploying these models and sort of when we shouldn't. And often actually to equalize the performance on the same subgroup, on, on the subgroups, given the same data, it actually requires sort of a trade-off in performance from one, from one group to the other, right? And so it's when are we allowed to make these trade-offs and what types of trade-offs are reasonable and ethical is an open question. I, I don't think I personally have a great understanding of when we should do and when we shouldn't, but it's just it's just an important problem. The gender bias, I wonder if that might be related a lot to cancers, because I know with clinical trials for cancers, there's an issue around the epidemiology in the cancer in the clinical trials doesn't, or the population, the study population doesn't relate all the time to the study population, the actual population of those who tend to get those cancers. But it's again about that recruitment into the clinical trials, who you tend to get. There is the more, most of the time you tend to get more men in clinical trials than you get women. And, you know, so it's, it's a very interesting conversation. I'd love to debate with you, not debate, we're not debating, but, you know, <laughs> discuss with you further because it's, it's, I don't know what the answer is and you're completely right. If you're, Yes, there might be this slight bias, but then it still gives a good prediction of outcomes that could benefit both groups. What happens there? I don't know. These are things that people are probably going to be deba debating forever yeah, until maybe they then decide, you know, what, let's just see what happens. <laughs> and then they get some a different level of data and understanding by actually just saying, let's see what happens in a practical setting. Because there's also, does that apply to AI as well, where you would have the model, because I, when you were talking before about the practical challenges, which is if you develop the model in a certain environment, then you try and lift it and put it in another setting, there is a little bit of a, you know, you have to optimize for that environment. So does that happen sometimes where, and I, I may have got this a little bit wrong in my sort of understanding, but um, can it happen that in a lab, let's say in-house, you would develop a model that in theory should work really well, then when you apply it to real world application, it just doesn't do what you predict it? Does that happen as well with AI? Okay. Yes, definitely. You know, one very obvious example is if the group that you're training the model on is just very different from the group that you're predicting on. You would expect to see actually big performance gaps. One very possible example would be, you know, your data set is mostly, mostly contains men and then you deploy it and it has men and women now and the model performs a lot worse on the subset of the data that it hasn't seen. And, you know, that's one that's, equ that's simple to sort of optimize for, but there's also more subtle examples. So for example, you train a, a model that detects TB here in the United States where we have very fancy or in the UK where we have all these fancy systems for doing these types of screening and then you try to take it to a place that you know actually has TV and then turns out that the systems that they use there are a lot less sort of advanced maybe it's a it's a film and then people take a cell phone picture of it and so you know it's 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 not it's not necessarily it's not necessarily the case and often not the case that the model will perform equally well in both settings so definitely definitely it's an, it's a it's an open issue and you know, and also with models, it's not clear sort of who who's responsible, right? If a model sort of makes a misprediction on a given case. People talk a lot about this in the context of self-driving cars, but it might even be more applicable here in healthcare, which is that, you know, if the model makes a mistake and it and it, and it, and it hurts somebody in, in the in clinical practice, who's responsible? And it's it's not clear either. Who is responsible? Is it the person who developed the code who then said who it maybe developed the, the initial code who then gave the okay at the final stage is it the healthcare professional who prescribes for the ai to do the action oh it's a minefield on that minefield actually what are the risks of foul play or hacking or anything that can happen with deep tech ai and health yeah that's a great question there's you know a lot of risks there, there's definitely risks of hacking one that you hear a lot and is very well studying the literature is adversarial examples where you have examples that are trained or tuned to you know cause the ai to make mispredictions i personally don't think this is that large of a practical issue and I, 
the best story I have for this is when we were working on self-driving cars, which is that, you know, the, the most adversarial, and so one issue that people talk about is adversarial stop signs, which, which are, you know, stop signs that people have edited or, or sort of added a sticker to, for example, to make a model mispredict that maybe, hey, there's no stop sign there. And this is some work by Justin Gilmer and some other folks I used to work with at Google. And, um, but you know, that the, in, in reality, the most adversarial stop sign is the one that just got blown over by the wind and is no longer there, right? But the important thing is to build a system that is robust to to certain sort of errors that the AI might make, right? Just because the stop sign has been blown over or isn't there doesn't mean you can crash into the car that's coming on, that, that's that's driving past you, right? And so and it's similar here where, you know, it's important to build systems that are robust to certain AI model misclassifications, which do happen and, and, and will happen. And, you know, and, you know, as with most technologies that deal with people's data, privacy and security are paramount, especially, you know, and this isn't unique to AI, you know, anytime you're sort of storing a lot of people's data electronically and sort of using, using those to sort of make decisions and sort of otherwise influence care, it's really important to handle that properly. And that's, that's an outstanding issue with most technology AI being one of them. You've been listening to the Monday Science Podcast, a weekly show bringing you the latest research and news in science, technology, medicine, and health. We hope you've gotten some useful and thought-provoking info from the show, and we hope you had fun along the way. We know we did. We'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hook up with us on our website at www.mondaysciencepodcast.com. Shoot us an email at info at mondaysciencepodcast.com. Find us on Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube at Monday Science. And access episode summaries at mondayscience.medium.com. See you next week on the Monday Science Podcast.